here today. Um, I love, if, if there's anything that you should know about me, is that I'm probably one of the biggest human-centered design nerds that you will ever meet. Like, I get way too excited about this stuff. So getting up and getting to talk about things that, like this that I'm passionate about um, are a real pleasure for me. So today, I really wanted to talk a little bit about UX. This is a term that gets floated around a lot. Um, it comes from a lot of different industries. It's highly misunderstood. It's highly misunderstood uh, in the context of industry and how it's applied. And so today, you know, I really wanted want to challenge all of you to um, to try to understand like some basic principles that you can take away with you, both as a professional and how you kind of interpret user experience when you're leading teams, um, as a student when you're looking for jobs, and even how you approach this from a faculty perspective when you're talking about it in context. So I'm going to kind of start out with a question. I want. I want everybody in this room to really think about how well can you explain what you do as a human being? How well can you explain what you do? I know I often have stumbled over explaining what I do. Um, this is my mom. Uh, my mom is a retired K through 12 art teacher. It's pretty easy for her to explain what she does for a living. People get it when she goes, yeah, I teach art. I teach art to elementary and high school. And, um, Unfortunately, I don't really have that kind of job where I can have that easy recognition. And it took me years to really like stumbling through explaining what I do as a human-centered design or designer, or even a product designer in digital where I am now. Um, but you know, I had this epiphany a couple years ago that I finally understood. Like I could finally explain to my mom who doesn't come from the academic or industry world that I do. Um, she finally got it. And the reason I knew my mom understood what I did for a living was she recently redid her kitchen. She lives in this really old farmhouse in Lancaster, Pennsylvania that's like 300 years old. And it had this really like nasty old kitchen from the 70s with like this, this gold like countertop and like dark wood that was just not, not in great shape. And so she saved up money and she, she got the new kitchen to put in. And so I called her after and I said, well, how do you like it? And she said, oh, well, I have like this new stove and I can't figure out how to program the timer on it. It's really bad user experience. And I'm like, yes, she understands what that is. I have done my job as a professional. My mom, the art teacher, understands what user experience design is. But it's up to all of us to be able to do that for not just our mom, but the person that's going to hire us, the coworker, the groups that we speak to to help educate. And so, you know, my next question for all of you is, how well can you, can the person hiring you explain what you do? Because there's a good chance that they don't really understand what user experience design is either. Uh, it could be a recruiter that is a, a recruiter that recruits for lots of different positions, and because UX is very confusing, um, it's really important that you personally can articulate this. So today, in an effort to be able to clarify these things, I want to cover three lessons. The first one is the big difference between UX and UI. So, because these get conflated all of the time. The second lesson is the history of UX as an industry. Because in order to understand why it is so darn confusing, we have to understand how we got here in the first place and what has created that confusion. And third, we're gonna really talk about the maturity of user experience in an organization, in industry. What are the different flavors that it looks like? Like, what does it look like when a company's really struggling with it? And what does it look like when a company's <coughs> doing it well? So I'm gonna start out with a question. So who can tell me what UX is? Who is a brave soul in here that's willing to be tribute? Anybody? Yes. So user experience is uh, basically everything that the user uh, experiences while using whatever product. So um, it includes the interface, but also the experience of whatever of using whatever product it is. Awesome. Well, see, I'm done. Have a good day. <laughs> That's a really great answer, actually. Um, and I try to boil it down uh, into starting out with this statement. UX is not UI. 
So if UX is not UI, what is UX? Um, what is your name? James. James. What James said was a great uh, kind of summary of what I wanted to really clarify with everybody in this room. So user experience is not just me with a app on my phone, the graphic user interface that I'm interacting with. Experience is everything for a person interacting with a product, with a company. Um, it can be the service design of a customer service call when somebody picks up the phone when you're having a problem, the words they use on the other end. It could be a physical product. How does something like this fit in the shape of my hand? Does it allow me to easily do what I'm doing, which is deliver a lecture and not be hindered by the thing that I'm holding? Um, and it also can be the interface, which is the confusing part. So people conflate the two because of the history that I'm going to go into a minute of where the term UX came from. But it is all of these things. It's the combination of these. Um, and when you think about user experience and how we figure out like, what that user experience should be, you move through human-centered design, which is the research strategy and design. And I believe, I assert, that user experience encompasses all of these activities in order to make the decision of what the actual end product or offering or service design is going to be. Um, these things come down to three basic principles. The first one is really, as a practitioner, looking at what the current experience is for somebody. So for example, I work in educational technology. If we are trying to design a new feature for our customers, our customers are developers that are trying to stay up on their skills, their development skills, maybe learning new languages and frameworks. Um, we might create a new feature like a note-taking tool for a video course. But before we ever create that note-taking tool, what we've heard from people, at, and we have the suspicion, is that somebody would need to be able to capture information and annotate while they're watching a course. Um, but instead of just designing it and putting it in front of people, we go into the context and watch our learners and see what they're doing today. Are they sitting there with a notebook? Are they taking notes on post-its? Do they have a second browser window open? And we understand what their current existence looks like, what their current pain points are. So then we can take that information, understand what those things are, so we can figure out like, what the opportunities are for creating, and then actually go and create that thing. And that's really the basic principles of user experience design, which has a human-centered design foundation. So when we're doing these research, the research, so the thing I just described where we're going in context, watching somebody use our product, is we're kind of looking for these things. This is the laundry list of stuff we're looking for. The goals of the person as they're sitting there doing these tasks. Um, what the actual tasks are that they're trying to accomplish. Their desires, like why are they doing this? What are they trying to get to? Um, in our case, a lot of people want a, um, a promotion or they're trying to get a new job, or they're trying to be able to gain the skills to complete a project that they're working on. Um, what the pain points are when they're encountering getting from where they are today to achieving those goals. And then all of the workarounds, like we do workarounds as humans, it's problem, basic problem solving. Um, if you uh, can't go from A to B, like point A to point B in a straight line, you're gonna take a different road. And so workarounds and pain points, those are huge like, red flags for us, that there's something that we could solve more easily with a product, which is why we end up making something like an in-browser note-taking tool that can append to a video course, um, because people are writing down maybe timestamps on a piece of paper, and that's their workaround. So the research, it's not just watching one person. We have to make sure that we talk to a cohort of people that represent the people that we think we should go design for. Because we really want to, at the end of the day, gather empathy and understand what it's like to walk a mile in that person's shoes. And I can't say this word enough. So then once we really figure out what it's like to walk a mile in that person's shoes, we can go and start to do human-centered design strategy. And the strategy is really going in and pulling apart all of the needs that we've identified. And that's kind of the fun part for me. There's lots of different ways that you can do that, lots of different tools. Um, and I'll go into a few of those in a second. But those, pulling those out then allow you to reimagine the current capabilities. 
Um, it's interesting, a lot of people like to use the, the example, if you go and ask a person that had only ridden horses, um, I guess it was Henry Ford, if you go and ask them what they want, they'd say they want a faster horse. It's because they, they don't have the imagination to uh, look at current capabilities with new techn technology that's available. And so that's what we do as practitioners, is we understand those things and we try to uh, merge those to create these new offerings that don't exist. Um, and then really help direct future offerings. In the context of a business, yes, designers can um, design something that's really amazing, but if it doesn't make sense in the company context, it doesn't make sense to do it. Um, for example, as an ed tech company, we're not gonna go design like an educational offering for somebody that's in the sixth grade. That's not our market. Like if we were to do that, we could do an awesome job, but we don't have the sales team or the support or the networks um, or the, the customers in there. So you have to look at that context as well. So a couple of the ways that we go and do some of the strategy work, um, we do a lot of interviewing of people. And I used to work for a company called AMC Health. I built their user experience department there in, in the technology sector. And we would go through, we were working, we were interviewing people that were doing um, clinical trial facilitation. So highly technical interviews about what they were doing. And it really helped us to have all of the interviews transcribed and then go in and look for those things that I had listed earlier, the pain points, the workarounds, the goals and objectives, and really dig into what was happening and then be able to start to gather those items and map them. Um, you can map these things in a couple different ways. The first thing that you want to do, and I had talked about personas last time, um, is a, a good persona, the goal of this is um, not necessarily to inform what you're creating itself, but to inform who you are creating for. And so when you have a team of people that are designing for a group, for, for people, you're trying to remove cognitive bias. Now as humans, we all have our own personal experiences, and we all like to we are inclined to design and make decisions based on what we have personally experienced. Design for our mom, for our neighbor, for our friend, for ourselves. And that's really hard to break because that's human evolution. That's what helps keep you alive. You touch a hot stove, you don't touch it a second time because you've been burned once. Um, but if you can create this persona, it does this mental trick. And it allows you to, to anchor on a person that you feel like you know that really represents a cohort of research. And it's a powerful tool for teams to have and to um, design towards. But personas alone won't get you there. Um, you can take all of those chunks that you've pulled out of uh, all of the interviews you've done, and you can start to arrange these little insights and start to quantitatively see what is rising to the surface as the biggest opportunity. With a user needs map, you can start to see, like, I, I wish I had, the, I wish I could read this, <laughs> but. You'll see large groups of things, and those are the ones that you, it helps remove bias because as individuals listening to an interview or conducting it, we normally anchor on certain things that we hear and we think that we're hearing them more, but we're actually not. So this helps keep us honest. And then journey mapping, journey map, so user needs mapping is really good for looking at the big picture and what's rising to the surface. Journey mapping helps you map something that is happening sequentially across time so you can really understand what's happening. And of course, this is all because we need to have empathy and understand what's happening with our users in order to be good designers. All right, so last but not least, now we've done all of our research, we know exactly what we need to do. Um, we really need to make sure that what we're designing kind of hits three milestones in ex user experience design. The first, is it useful? Is it actually addressing the needs that we heard and summarized and designed for? If it's not useful, then people are gonna not adopt it. For example, we know like people love to introduce things into the app store, and there's just like millions of apps out there that somebody will download once, and they'll be like, it might be like usable, easy to use, but if it doesn't actually help them achieve an objective or outcome, they're not going to keep using it. Um, the second is, it could be really useful, <coughs> But if it is like very complex and doesn't make sense when you're in the process of using it, the usability, then you, the adoption won't be there either because you're not actually creating something um, that somebody can use day to day in order to achieve the usefulness objective. 
And last but not least, and this one gets forgotten a lot, but I like to really push all my designers and product managers to think deeply about, is this desirable? What is the emotional element? So when we take something and put a concept in front of somebody, like, and they're clicking through it, do they smile? Are they excited to use it? Do they want to go tell their family about it? These are the things that if you can hit these, you know that you've kind of had the trifecta of, of what it takes to create something that's amazing design for your users. And again, I just want to reiterate that you can apply all of these in different ways to different products. It can be a physical product. It can be an interaction with a human. It can be an environmental design. It's not always just digital. So, <laughs> all right, so quiz one. So what is UX? This is when you guys say? Not people. Yes. All right. Let's say it all together. One, <laughs> one, two, three. UX, UX is, is not, not UI. UI. Yeah, that's good. All right. So if UX is not UI, you're like, OK, Mariah, that makes sense. Why are people so confused about this? Why, why don't people get it? Well, let me tell you a little bit about the history of user experiences in an organization. So, the history of user experience as, as an industry, um, I'm going to start with this question. What industry did UX come from? Can anybody tell me that? Any other brave souls? The human computer interaction. That's one of them. Where else did it come from? Marketing. Marketing, yeah. Where else? Web design. Yeah. It's come from a lot of different places. In fact, it's come from all of them. Because any kind of offering or product you're creating, any service or company, it, you are creating an experience to serve the, your customers. And so, um, you know, it really gives me heartburn because this is a real job description that I pulled off of line that, that was running around um, when I was, I moved here from Dallas two years ago and I ran, I ran a meetup group there. And you can see, like, this job description um, the only thing you ask about it is the title, but the actual tactical skills, not so much. Um, in fact, the reason why we have job descriptions like this is um, we've come from so many different industries, and so I want to highlight like four industries, but it, it has really truly come from all of them. When you think about the history of experience design, you know, if you go back to the 1970s or the 1960s, um, you've got industrial design, so physical product development. They really cared about like physical usability. Um, what is the chair being used for? How tall is the person using it? Um, how long are they sitting in it? Like those kind of usability markers. And then, you know, back in the 1970s, you know, you didn't have everybody on computers yet, you, but you didn't have graphic designers, and they were really all doing print design, and they really cared about information usability. What is the information architecture? What do people see first? Is the message getting across? Then you had animators. Back in the day, animation, hand-drawn, they really cared about usability through storytelling. Do people understand the sequence of events that I'm putting in front of them? And then you had developers as well. I mean, computing was starting, but they didn't have any really UI yet. It was all about function execution. Is this machine doing what I want it to do when I input X, Y, and Z? So usability has really sat across all of these industries. But back then, none of them touched each other. They were very disparate. Um, but then if you fast forward to like the late 80s, the early 90s, computers had shrunk in size and cost. And they were now starting to become ubiquitous in homes. And so what was happening was all of these different uh, usability, indus industries with usability desires have now come together in this one instrument, a computer, where you have industrial designers that had previously not had to deal with screen-based products. All their products had like buttons. Um, graphic designers suddenly are creating user interfaces, which is very different than print design. You had developers who are creating user-facing platforms, which again, had not been a thing of the past and animators that are creating these interaction designs and digital animations. But now the problem is, well, when you have all of these different disciplines working on this one thing, you start to have this new need for understanding 
the user experience across all of these at once. And so you start to have the role of user experience designer that should be covering all of these things. Um, but people were like, I don't really know how to articulate that. What should I even know? What industry do I come from? There weren't educational programs. Um, and in fact, I guess, who was it? Don Norman, who is a, a very well-known, notable industrial designer, who had also worked in human-computer interaction, um, claims to have coined the phrase user experience. A lot of people claim that, um, but I, I kind of believe him. So um, Don says, you know, I, I put this out there. He was working at Apple. Um, as a way to describe this new paradigm of, of uh, interaction design. Um, but people were conflating it, which was really frustrating to him. Um, and so, you know, fast forward to today, you have these job descriptions that really have components of all of these different areas in them because companies just don't really understand kind of the ubiquity of experience design and all of the stuff that I like described in my talk a little bit earlier. Um, which is really the work that needs to be done in order to create great experience design, not necessarily being able to code or um, not, you don't necessarily need to be a visual designer um, or be able to do things <coughs> modeling. And so, you know, what I think the, the challenges for us as professionals, um, as a community, is really to be able to articulate to each other, to the industry, and to um, the people that are hiring us what we can do and because I get a lot of people out of college that you, you look at their resumes and they claim they can do all the things all the things and it's because they've either you know had one day in their class where they learned a little CSS um, or maybe they understand some principles of animation but they haven't done any of them in depth and just because you understand that it exists doesn't mean that it should be on your resume and so what I, I encourage people to really start to do is go Okay, well, when it comes to the wide world of user experience, which can touch all these different types of products, which one are you really passionate and good at? Um, for me, for example, so I have industrial design knowledge. Um, I don't do that anymore. I'm very solidly in digital. And I know I care very much about software, and I know a lot about the educational technology, the excuse me, educational field and the healthcare industry. And so when I go and I look for a new job, that's what I clearly articulate, as well as what I think the role of UX designer should be. And so, you know, when you think about the wide world of UX, the new paradigm um, and the companies that are most forward thinking are really starting to approach user experience as an intersection of technology, design, and business. Um, I personally, in my current role, hire UX designers and product managers who work and partner together on teams. And I really expect both roles to know all of these things. Um, our product managers, we have a lot of people that come from business backgrounds and have really gotten interested in human-centered design. And so these people bring to the table um, a lot of great business acumen and design, and then they, uh, they start to learn the technology. Um, I think it was um, Marty Kagan who said, you know, to be an excellent product manager or UX designer, you have to go deep in one of these areas and understand all three of them very well. So, all right, we're gonna do better at this uh, question response thing. So, what industry did UX come from? All of them. You guys are good, okay. All right, so that kind of brings us to our third area. Um, lesson number three, the maturity of UX within an organization. So now that we understand what UX really is, we understand how it's gotten to where it is and the confusion around that, what does it look like now today in organizations? So who can tell me where UX sits within a mature organization? Who can tell me that? Any guesses? No? I've stumped you. This yeah. is excellent. See, I have something to teach today. Everywhere. All right. So if, um, if UX is uh, in all the industries, and it should be everywhere in an organization, what does that really mean? Um, so I'm going to start out by talking about the value that it brings before I get into the everywhere. So Airbnb, um, I believe that this is a slide is old, and Airbnb is worth a lot more than $24 billion today, but that's still a pretty darn big number. 
And so, you know, Airbnb almost didn't exist. And the, the, so they were struggling along as a, as a startup company. And, you know, they were getting, they were, were piloting Airbnb in New York City. And they were having great success getting people that owned apartments to post beds and listings and rooms on their site. But the problem was people would post, but nobody would book the rooms. And they're like, we don't get it. They're cheaper than the hotel rooms. Why aren't people booking them? And so they decided to go and talk to users that had gone on their website and had looked at the listings and had not booked because there was this, this clear pattern in their analytics. And what they found was these people said, well, you know, I go and look at these listings and yeah, it's cheaper, but like, look at the pictures of what people are posting compared to the pictures of the hotels. And we've all seen the shiny hotel pictures. They're very compelling. They're usually unrealistically like <laughs> manicured. Um, I stay in hotels a lot, so <laughs> I call their bluff. Um, but they figured out it was the pictures that just weren't professional enough. People weren't used to that paradigm yet. So they hired a bunch of professional photographers to go out to these people and take professional photographs of the exact same spaces. And guess what started to happen? They started to gain traction. And when you start to gain traction, more people come in and fund your business. But if they hadn't gone and talked to those users in the first place, Airbnb would not be around today. And now you can see like the hockey stick effect um, of a company uh, that really understood the disruption of a market. But it's, you know, it's all in the details. That's what user experience is all about. And so companies that aren't going and doing those things and they aren't talking to users are the companies we never hear about. And you know, it's not just the startup companies that are taking note of this. IBM Design, um, they spent $100 million on a huge new uh, facility north of Austin, Texas. I think it was back in 2014 they opened it. And they started an internal education program for everybody in the company. They said human-centered design needs to be a cornerstone of what we do. And everybody needs to understand it. It's not just the UX designers. Everybody from the like, C-level executives down to the janitor. You're going to have at least a little education and orientation, if not a longer program, to understand why this is important to us and the impact it can have. They really wanted to change the mindset around people thinking design is looking, making something look pretty Two, design is actually how we create our offerings and understand our users. Um, and if you can't create it yourself, buy it. So Capital One, they decided to buy Adaptive Path, which was an agency that they had been working with for a long time that had helped them achieve a lot of success with all of their, their platforms, their user-facing platforms, including, um, I guess it was back in 2015, a really amazing mobile app that was basically attracting more customers to, to use them just because of the usability and usefulness of it. Um, so this kind of brings us to the actual companies. Like why, so where do companies start to falter? So it's great that they want to invest in this. Um, but you can go in, into companies and look at like what types of products the UX teams work on to understand if human-centered design is truly ubiquitous throughout the company. So you've got like UX designers mostly today working on like web and mobile applications, um, but then you have some desktop and employee tools that they're looking at as well. But here are some areas that are starting to get ignored. You know earlier when I talked about how it was important to understand that UX is not just digital, it's all these other things. Um, a lot of companies are still really missing the mark on that. So you've got services and support and in-store and retail and customer support, print and packaging, there are all these other touch points where people aren't thinking through the whole life cycle of how people interact with the company, how a customer interacts with the company from the time they learn about it through using the product, through exiting, uh, being a customer. You create this, this thing that, somebody, that has been kind of termed as the digital divide that is happening within companies uh, that are struggling. And the digital divide is unfortunate because then UX is just kind of like relegated to the high impact to the digital platforms, but it doesn't carry through. You have this low impact uh, UX in the marketing areas, and so companies aren't really getting the full advantage of that. What I would assert is that companies really need to approach user experience design of kind of like the end-to-end -end journey. As a customer, so example, I work for Pluralsight right, right now, our customers at Pluralsight before they ever are a customer, they're learning about what we do. 
So that's part of their user experience. Then they have an experience when they're buying or subscribing to our platform. And they use our platform. And then there's service that happens. What if something breaks? What if it's a company, um, a company plan and their single sign-on that's part of their package and their employees can't use that? And they have to interact with our, our service department, customer support. And then at some point, they might replace it. Um, we might actually replace our own platform, and what does that look like for them? Or they might replace us with somebody else, which can also be a, a good experience or a bad experience for them. I would always assert that like, if you're a customer, um, if you're a company and your customer decides to leave, that experience is just as important as the experience of using or learning about it, because they might always come back. Have you, have, has anybody tried to like unsubscribe from something online and it's just like impossible? You never are gonna go back to them, right? That's what you're gonna remember about them. So that user experience is just as important as the rest of the cycle. That, by the way, is called dark UX and it's very bad. <laughs> Don't ever trap customers, it's mean. Um, okay, so there are key markers that you look for within companies, and this is very important, particularly if you're looking for a job or you're running a company, um, to understand these areas where uh, UX needs to show up and what it looks like. So in an outdated company, the scope of user experience is usually like maybe just digital and maybe just ad hoc. Ad hoc means there's not like a person on a team that's dedicated to that. It's like they're building something, oh by the way, let's bring in our one UX designer with 40 developers to like clean this up. Um, that's a very outdated way of doing that. For strategy, UX has nothing to do with the strategy. Um, in good human-centered design, you, as I illustrated earlier, strategy is really dictated by what you're going and finding from users. But there are lots of companies where you have a leadership team that says, I had this great idea in the shower the other day, or I know, I know best because I'm the leader, and they make these decisions for the company, and it's not necessarily the best one. Um, I think about like the wisdom of, so Aaron Sconard is the CEO of Pluralsight, and he started out, him and two partners, and they flew around the country and trained people in technology, and that's what they did for a living. It would have been very easy for Aaron to transform his three-person consulting uh, group uh, and like move through to now we're 750 people in an education technology company, it'd be very easy for Aaron to say, I know best, I started this company, I understand. But Aaron is a very wise CEO and he understands human-centered design and he said, you know, if we have 20 product teams out there with their ear to the street talking to all the customers, they know what we need best. They can see the future more than I can as a single person. I am now focused on running this company and understanding like where we're driving to and setting that North Star, not telling people to go build a notes feature, which is what happens at a lot of companies. Um, so research. These companies that are outdated, maybe they do usability testing, which means they put an interface in front of a person to make sure they can navigate through it, but that's it. Um, design really just is kind of wireframes. And then when it comes to staffing, all you have are generalist contributors on the team. Um, you don't have people that really understand, like, what does it look like to conduct an expert interview with a customer and pull the information out? Um, they're probably tasked with doing all the things. Again, like one UX designer and a team of 40 developers. How deep are they going to be able to go in certain research aspects? So it's not all bad. These outdated companies are becoming fewer in number as people start to understand the value of this. You see a lot of people now sitting in this progressing company area. When it comes to scope, it's not just digital. Um, it's multiple digital touch points. So if you have a front-end website, maybe a mobile application, desktop app, um, you're going to see a team that is looking across all of them, which is encouraging because they're starting to link that experience chain of what customers experience. Under strategy, um, they're start, progressing companies are starting to gather some requirements from your really amazing design teams and product teams that are out there talking to customers. It might not run the entire strategy, but at least they're listening to them and they're taking those things into account. It gives them a more directional correctness when they go and build things. As far as research goes, instead of just usability testing, you also iterate through testing as you're building things. You, you, 
create something and you put it in front of people and then you you know adjust it and put it in front of some more people um, and they're also you're starting to see ethnographic research which is contextual research going and watching users in the context of what they're doing um, and talking to more people in a qualitative way under design instead of just wireframes you have um, like sketch to high fidelity which means that people are starting to take advantage of computer programs like sketch and envision where before anything goes into code you can still simulate clickable prototypes and get those in front of people the the more um, realistic thing you can put in front of a user the better the feedback you're going to get to create the best thing possible and then as far as staffing people are starting to understand you need full teams you need people that really understand research that understand different interaction design techniques visual design and prototyping now this, this is where we all, all want to go work. <coughs> and, and not just go work here if you're a UX designer. If you're a team member and you're working on any kind of product, which most of us will be at some point, if we're not already, um, if your company operates like this, your company has a better chance for being way more successful. And it also means that they have executive leadership that understands this. and you are more likely to work in an environment where you are more autonomous and accountable for your work instead of just being told what to do with a laundry list of tasks. It's a very different kind of cultural dynamic within companies that truly embrace this. Um, so scope, as far as that goes, that's more, uh, the modern is just end-to-end -end and non-digital. So what I talked about before was everything from when a customer learns about a product, they buy it, they experience it, they leave it, like the whole end-to-end, -end, customer service, um, documentation, you name it. It is all touched. And I work for a company that I believe is super progressive. I moved here for Pluralsight two years ago because they told me about how they incorporate in human-centered design. I have not just been disappointed. We have not conquered that yet. Um, we're working on it. So strategy. Um, strategy is really you know the, the people that are doing the product teams that are out there that are hearing what is happening with customers they really help set and shape the roadmap that is aligned to our North Star today at plural site um, our, our c-suite does a great job of telling us like where we're gonna go we have something that we call a 2020 vision and it's like where we want the company to be in three years and, um, and that's awesome because it's not super prescriptive and we can go to the teams and go, based on what you're hearing and based on that objective we're trying to achieve, like how should we achieve it? How does your part, how does your role like fit into that? Um, what should we go design in this area? And it's really effective because, well A, we have amazing people that work for us that do a great job and are knowledge practitioners. And it's not our CEO telling them like what to go build. It's our CEO saying, how do we get here? And they go, I know, because I'm talking to the customers. It's really cool. Um, as far as research goes, you have both qualitative and quantitative. The new paradigm of product is it's great. The human center design stuff is like super important. The next generation of this is now we have really sophisticated systems out there that you can kind of plug triggers into your digital products and understand how they're performing. And you can connect those back to the objectives of the vision and strategies to see and tweak and monitor what's happening. Um, within design, design, and when I say design, it's not just visual design, it's experience design, product design, what you're actually offering. They set and govern, it, they set, uh, and govern the experience standards, period. It's not marketing telling you what to do. It's not sales telling you what to build. It's the product team. Um, and then understaffing, last but not least, I really believe, and again, the reason I moved here to Utah is we had executive leadership. We have a chief experience officer in our company that sits next to our CEO and our chief marketing officer and our chief sales officer and, uh, and centralized strategy and governance around user experience design. So we have that support. I know that I've spent a bunch of my career managing up as like the, the lone design person that goes, we really should go talk to people. But you can only move the needle so far in one of those situations, which is why I decided to pursue product leadership. I got so frustrated at a point in my career, I'm like, I'm gonna just gonna, I'm gonna have to go build this myself because nobody else is doing it. I couldn't find anybody. Um, luckily, that's starting to change, but you still don't see it a ton, which is why it's kind of over here in the modern category. 
So now that we understand that, I'm going to ask you this question again. Where is UX in a mature organization? Everywhere. Good. Man, you guys are so good. All right. So I'm going to kind of leave you with this. Again, bringing back my mom up. Um, if I can explain what I do to my mom, I have no doubt that you guys can all explain this to your colleagues, to your moms, to your friends, and to the people that are going to hire you in the organizations that you're going to work in. Um, it's really important that we're able to articulate this and the value as we move forward in progressing ourselves and our organizations and what we can offer the world. Um, the better we can explain what we do, the better we can go out and create solutions. <coughs> all right, so one more time, just to bring it all home. What is UX? UX is not UI. <laughs> yes! What industry did UX come from? All of them. Yes. And where is UX in a mature organization? So I get this question and it's really hard because it depends on the scale of an organization. If you're a large company like <coughs> Facebook or Google or Microsoft, there are going to be pockets within your company that are at different levels. It just depends on where they sit. So our company is a high growth startup company at Pluralsight. Um, I joined two years ago, we had 450 people, we have 750 people today and that growth trajectory is continuing. Um, I would put us like kind of in the, the modern category, even though we're not like perfect. Um, but it's easy for me to see because I've been there and I've worked in it and I know it's, it's truly there. Um, so I don't have a good answer for that. I, I know people ask me that because they're like, who should we go work for? And I'm like, you don't know until you are in an interview situation because it can change year to year too. You lose a leader, things can shift. Um, it's always kind of a moving target. So again, it's really important that we understand like what questions to go ask so that we can evaluate that when we're in that situation. I think that's important. Yes? What strategies or suggestions do you have for convincing others of the value of UX if we are lower in that, in that decision making? Yeah, it's really hard. It is hard that's to manage up. <laughs> <laughs> um, my favorite tactic when I was trying to convince people, there was one point um, where I was brought into, so I, when I worked for AMC Health, we were a remote patient monitoring company, and my executive leadership was not a chief experience officer, it was our chief technology officer that brought me in. He, there was, he showed up there to start working in the company, and he's like, oh my gosh, nobody's actually governing design. And he had worked with me before, so he had heard my, my spiel, my evangelism of, of this, and he knew we needed it, but he didn't know it in depth. Um, and so I was constantly, uh, I was always trying to scare people into to doing it and being like, you know, if we don't go test this and we put it out there and this guy doesn't take his blood pressure and he ends up back in the hospital, that's liability on our company. So we should really go do user testing. Like, and so there's, you know, kind of, you, you're not always in um, a high stakes situation like that. So that tactic doesn't always work. But you, if you can correlate not testing something back to the company losing money or putting them at risk, that is a good story to tell because you're usually explaining to stakeholders that understand the business objectives and that's what they really care about. Um, so that's that's how I would probably push it. Or you can go work for somebody that gets it. <laughs> that's the ideal. <laughs> but in lieu of that, yes? Well, you know, the, the, the trick in these type of situations, you are always um, kind of uh, fighting against the brand. Okay. Yeah. You know, you mentioned the case there of their PMP, all right? I don't know exactly what happened there, but I'm sure that whoever actually did the uh, test of going and asking, you know, finding the customers and everything, first was not an executive. No, it was the founders. Oh, the founders yes. did that? Yeah, it was the founders did it. That came up they with were the struggling. 
they were struggling because they weren't, it was like, in order to get the next round of funding, because they were still in seed funding, mm -hmm. they had to show people using it, right? Yeah. And uh -huh. people weren't, like they were getting stuck. And so they went and started talking to their users. Okay, well that, that, is, that is actually, you know, uh, in my experience. Unique. A unique thing. Yeah. Okay, because usually when you hear these cases are, are people that are, you know, they could be anywhere in the organization, but they just happen to have the idea, okay, let's do this, and they go and do it, and then they come up with, you know, a, a unique solution. Yeah. Okay. So in this case, it was the, the, the founders. It was but the founders. That, is, that is actually not, not the common thing, or is it, what, what do you? It hasn't been, mm -hmm. but now as people are starting to understand, like, just go talk to users, just go talk to customers. You're starting to see that more, um, and you're starting to see that promoted not just within kind of the technology space, but also like, the marketing field and being able to go talk to users in a different way about awareness of whatever they're marketing. You're, you're starting to see it more. It's, it's only been the past few years though that I've, because I used to do this talk and people were like, we've never even heard the words UX. We've never even heard the words user experience design. <coughs> so it's the balance is shifting slowly. It's a slow turn. Anybody else? Yes. All right, Jen. Uh, so what's, what's your like rule in walking the line between like a designer's like intuition and their like opinion and just listening to the user because like there's all these you know like the Steve Jobs quote where he's like I don't listen to my users I just I make something they don't even know they want yet you know and then the other quote where it's like we only listen to users and we only talk to yeah. them. So there is a difference between going and walking a mile in the, sh in the shoes of a user or going and asking them what should I build. And so if you go and walk a mile in the shoes of a user, the very experienced practitioners will be able to take that information and understand like what all the pain points are. And then that, that in and of itself takes a lot of practice. And then you take that and you compare it to like, there are these new technologies out there. How can we use them to solve these problems in a, in a disruptive, unique way? Which is what um, Steve Jobs did. Even though he said, oh, I don't listen to users. Yeah, he was listening to users, but he wasn't like saying, hey, what do, what do you want me to go build for you? And so if you can take that, that's where the design practitioner comes in. If you're informed in your industry, you understand what the next technology can enable, you can create something that's really different. Um, and that's not so much, in, when you say intuition, it's more of a awareness and science and like seniority in your skill set. Um, a more junior designer would really have difficulty with some of that strategy work. Whereas if you hire somebody really senior, which is why I always <coughs> companies are like, well, I could get a UX designer for like $40,000 a year. Why would I hire somebody and pay them, you know, $100,000? I'm like, because they can't, the younger one, well, not younger, but less experienced one, they can't necessarily do that because they haven't done it before, they don't understand it. Or if they don't have expertise in the, the industry. So that's kind of the difference in my opinion. All right, thank you so yeah. much.